um, wrong place. Uh, you weren't supposed to see this, but uh, how you been? It's been a while, huh? Since I made a an effort into making a you know a, a somewhat productive, interesting video with some proper content. The last two videos weren't particularly my mo, so here I am. Uh, getting killed by sharks that cast some sort of ice skill but that doesn't matter what we're here today for is of course the title which you all obviously know of course you would beforehand is radiator now let me get myself prettied up for you uh, this is clearly not it Okay then, so we're here, uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today. No, we're not going to talk about why I keep dying everywhere. We're going to talk about these jellyfish is a common term, but we will use the term cnidarians. Yes, cnidarians and tenophores. And by the end of this beautiful video, all of you, I'm sure, will be able to tell me what class these jellyfish are. Because we all know that is what we come for here. We come here to be able to decipher and know very, very useful things that we can apply to real love. Including right here. Now, we could ask ourselves and begin this discussion by understanding, by trying to understand how life started at the very bottom of the ocean where eukaryotic life came about and then we could go further on to talk about more boring microbiology stuff but that's not why we're here we are here, after all, to talk about jellyfish now, jellyfish are considered, at least as far as I'm concerned in the book that I am reading uh, the second in line of creatures that evolved in a manner that is significant enough for us to discuss. Now, jellyfish in particular are part of this group that no longer is used, but we will use anyway, called radiata, radiata, whatever you call it. But the reason why they're called radiata is because they are, of course, radially symmetrical. Now, after the sponge, if it's not altered by currents, cnidaria and tenophores, jellyfish and those that look like jellyfish but are lying to us, are all part of this group of creatures that are, gen are radially symmetrical. There are no other creatures generally that we know of that tend to be radially symmetrical. Not phyla, at least. Now, cnidarians have a couple of diagnostic features, one of them of course being they sting. So. Now, we need to remember, of course, that there are tenophores, and we will discuss them later. But for cnidarians, all of them always have stinging cells, stinging organelles called nematosis. Some cnidaria have biradial symmetry, which means they have some sort of paired structure such that they are only symmetric along two planes. Again, this is not too relevant, but it is very nice to know. They, as very primitive creatures, have typically do not have beyond tissue level of cell organization. So you don't you don't really see organs and higher level structures. And generally, tenophores, which we have not discussed so far, are more complex in structure than cnidarians. Now, before we continue any further, we need to understand something else, and that is how we are formed as babies. Now, you see, when sperm fertilizes the egg, blah 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 happens, but now we're going to talk about that blah blah blah. You see, first off, the zygote undergoes something called cell division, and then it just forms a blastula, which is basically an egg that underwent a lot of cell division. Hundreds of cells. The second process is called gastrulation, whereby typically 
you form three germ layers and they are usually called the ectoderm, the mesoderm and the endoderm. Ecto meaning outside, meso meaning not meso but middle and endoderm meaning inside. And these cells later in the last stage in organogenesis morph into well organs and systems that we are familiar with in animals such as ourselves. Now that is the basic animal structure but Cnidaria being early in evolution typically only have two layers achieved after gastrulation the ectoderm and the endoderm. So therefore they're called eumetazoans or diploblastic. And this furthermore pauses the fact that tenophores which apparently have been observed to have muscle tissue have been argued to not actually have true muscle tissue because as you all know yes we all know beforehand that the mesoderm the middle layer is what forms your muscular system so that is well very much that there is another very unique feature that Cnidaria typically show which is that they have two stages often in the same life cycle the polyp stage and the medusa stage this means that even though we discriminate against jellyfish yes they have very few rights in the animal kingdom clearly we are only vis giving the medusa the recognition the medusa stage those that float around on tables waiting to be killed those that float around in the ocean generally they're weakly swimming which is why jellyfish are also often considered to be plankton now this is not always the case them having two stages but majority of them demonstrate this the other stage being the polyp stage is where they turn into a stalk with the same tentacles facing outwards however it's as if that that umbrella section became a cylinder and attached to a substrate in the ocean on the ocean floor or something else and Cnidaria with their various you know, their variations in their life cycle and various and plenty other features have been categorized into have a couple broad class categories which are very nice to know one of the, the first one being anthozoa second being storozoa skyphozoa cubozoa and lastly our favorite hydrozoa now in general when cnidarians have a polyp stage it can be solitary but it can also be colonial which means they can colonize and take apart well countries <laughs> polyps can be colonial in the sense that they can form in groups and sometimes there are even specializations for various groups within the colony to serve various purposes you can have the gastrozoids dactylozoids and you can have gonozoids or gonangia all of these are just groups of a colony that serve various functions gastrozoids feed dactylozoids defend and gonozoids have sex yes you often see this in hydrozoa by the way but I'm sure you can see them in other classes as well. In the gener general Cnidarian plan, if they form a zygote from sexual reproduction, that zygote becomes a planula larvae, and that in turn settles onto a substrate and, it's f and it first becomes a polyp. Now that polyp can sexually reproduce, asexually reproduce to either form a polyp or a medusa, or a combination of the two really. But the medusa, well, if the medusa is formed, medusa will usually reproduce sexually. You don't see jellyfish being asexual now. That's just too crazy. You 
You see, much like Hennessy's and many other maps which change a little bit when you go from one place to another, jellyfish have layers as well. But in this case, they have two distinct layers. In fact, Cnidarians and Tenophores, both being diploblastic, have, diploblastic, have two layers. Outside being the epidermis, and inside being the gastrodermis. See, the gastrodermis is where there's food, and chambers maybe, and the whole system to digest food. And in between these, just like how there's a portal here on the left, for jellyfish, or well for cnidarians, they have a mesoglea in the middle, connecting the two layers. Not quite connecting in this way, but sticking them together. Two classes within the cnidarians will never be able to be the free-swimming, lovely, sexy little jellyfish that we saw previously. Those are the Anthozoan class and the Storozoan class. Anthozoans and Storozoans have some differences, but Storozoans are relatively new, weird type of coral. Well, they're not quite coral. They're just a cnidarian that has is one of the classes that only has a polyp stage, just like Anthozoans. Now. Most of these are likely antozoans that we see here. Clearly, that's important, and I'm sure these are all accurate representations and recreations of corals, but that doesn't matter, even if they weren't. But these are possibly antozoans. If there were no Medusa stage, it would be very, very clear they are either an antozoan or a storozoan coral, at least. And that that's pretty helpful as far as we're concerned. Anthozoans are the more popular class that includes sea anemones, horny corals, thorny corals, hard corals, sea pens, sea fans, and uh, these are possibly, I'd guess, to be Octocorallia, a subclass of anthozoans. Octocorallia have an octomerous plan, as the name suggests. They have eight pinnate leather-like tentacles at all times, arranged around the margin of their oral disc, the, the side where the mouth is. Now, the other two subclasses, of which there are, in total there are only three in uh, subclasses within Anthozoa, there, the other two would be Serientipatharia, I don't know what the fuck that is anyway, and Zoantharians. So both of these generally show either a hexamerous body plan, so they have sixes, orders of six, instead of eight like the Octocorallia, or they have polymerous symmetry. Don't ask me what the fuck that is, Google it, or I'll show it on the screen. I'm sure I'll do one of those. And they also have simple tubular tentacles arranged in one or more circlets on their oral disc. So I guess maybe these could possibly be Octocorallia, just because look at the colors, but we never know, really. Uh, but these tree-like things, I don't know what the fuck they are, um, so let's just say misc. Now, that being said, Storozoa, let's just pretend this is the Storozoan, yeah, let's just pretend that. Storozoans are a little bit of a cute little pickle. You see, they've decided to be polyps, but it'll be a little special. For one, they only undergo sexual reproduction, that's not as that's not an exclusive thing for polyps at all. Polyps, in fact, usually demonstrate asexual reproduction, as we had described earlier. If you had paid attention, you fuck. And they also have non-swimming planula larvae, unlike all the other cnidarians with their general life cycle plan. They have eight extensions ending in tentacle clusters, and the top of their polyp typically resembles a medusa. It looks like a jellyfish is actually stuck on the end. Now, that being said, that's just the two classes that we know that have no medusa life cycle. No medusa in their life. We classify them as cnidarians because they still have stinging cells and a bunch of a lot of other of the basic biological properties that we observe as embryos and whatnot. Now aside from these two, can anybody remember what the other three classes are? Sure you do, absolutely, why would you not? You totally pay attention, perfectly. 
this is a 10 out of 10 A star class. Everybody remembers and cares what we talk about here. This is totally not a very lazy video where I'm trying to walk a little bit and talk at the same time. This is not a mess at all. I am not breaking down. Hydrozones. Hydrozones are a more more of a favorite staple to talk about and the reason why we're going to talk about these guys first is because we know that hydrozones actually have some species that have a medusa stage that secrete calcarea skeletons much like the anthozoans do. Coral reefs usually which have a huge growing coral skeleton are usually those are usually made by hermatypic corals, those who belong in the anthozoan class. Now aside from those guys, however, there are hydrozoans that have a polyp stage that can secrete huge amounts of ca uh, calcium skeletons as well. And they are known as hydrocorals, right? I was about to say hydrocarbons, that would make much sense, now would it? Now, this is not a chemistry class. Hydrozoans, they're somewhat all right you know i don't know what the point is of describing much about them really they're they're kind of here and there they're ba they basically have they, they tend to be the smaller types of jellyfish and they're not usually very harmful they're not scary they're not fast swimmers for one and you usually have the freshwater hydrozoans and the marine hydrozoans freshwater hydrozoans are usually a good example is a hydra that's what they're usually called and they have a, a couple of cool things that I'm not gonna bother describing because no one's gonna care and this video is gonna get really boring but hydroids which are marine have are the ones that typically are colonial and when they are colonial they will form um, a polyp that is very very uh, large and they will have specific parts of the colony specialized in doing different things as I mentioned before gastrozoids, dactylozoids and gonozoids as you guys all very eagerly remembered and recited those are applicable for the hydroids as we had mentioned I believe before as well they have the basic statuses and ocelli statuses are just a very reduced form of a calcium carbonate um, that helps with balance and equilibrium and ocelli, ocelli whatever however you pronounce it are rudimentary eye organs but they don't form images like we do so they wouldn't appreciate the video I'm making of them the one thing I forgot about is the fact that hydrozoans have a vellum yes not venom vellum which means that their medusa stage has has a shelf like inward almost fold it doesn't fold inwards per se but it it doesn't comp keep opening outwards. Now, when we go to the true jellyfish called Scyphozoa, or they're called the cup animals, they are the ones that can grow larger. The largest recorded diameter for them is two meters, and the length of their tentacles can extend from, could extend to up to 60 to 70 meters long. They do not have a vellum, which means that their cups, by the way, would be expanding. They wouldn't look like they've turned, you know, closed inwards. Now, aside from that, they have four gastric pouches and radial canals and ring canals and separate sexes, and they have the typical blah blah, you know, very boring planula larvae becoming a scyphistoma, which undergoes strobulation, which then becomes a euphyre, and then becomes a strobula. Yes, this is biology, guys. Final class that we're gonna quickly go over but it's probably the most deadly class ever and you should not play with them at all you should never play with them they're very very scary people um, is the cubozoans they are predominantly in the medusa form and the mysterious thing about these guys is we've never seen uh, a proper polyp form from them they're inconspicuous generally now the, transversely their bells right in the medusa form look like a square and they have a something like a vellum but it's called a velarium because this time 
it turns inwards the ends of the bells they turn inwards and yes they help in swimming again another thing is some cubozoans can have image forming eyes in fact at the base of each tentacle that you see they can have six eyes three different types which is you know kind of creepy but anyway that's just me they also have separate sexes and that is all for today Let me just get positioned here real quick. Can I go here? Oh wow. Okay, that's new. I never knew that existed. Hold on. Ah, oh, there we go. Now. Page 71. Actually, let's turn this down a little bit. It's getting a little bit too crazy. Hold on. <clears throat> Although the origin of the Cnidarians and Tenophores is obscure, one hypothesis suggests that the radiate phyla arose from a radially symmetrical, planula-like ancestor with a sessile or free-floating habitat. A planula larva in which an invagination evolved to become the gas.